to the 11th Z Jaipur Literature Festival, and we are right here at AU Bank Samwad. Can we please welcome our speakers for today, Martin Puchner, in conversation with Homi Bhava. The written world, the power of stories to shape people, history, and civilization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Martin, thank you so much for being here and giving me this opportunity to speak with you about uh, your book. Um, I wanted to give the audience a sense, before we begin, of the scope and sensibility of the book. If you could give a more general introduction to the book, this will make sure that all the people here purchase a copy of the book <laughs> once you have spoken. And I want to make sure that that happens. <laughs> That's so kind. Thanks. First of all, thank you, Homi, for, for being here with me. It's such an honor. So the, the, the scope of the book is vast in that it tells the story of literature from the invention of writing to the internet. So instead of reading the entirety of world literature, you can just read my book and it will be much faster, uh, I promise you. The, the through line is the intersection of storytelling and writing technologies. And that, that focus, the through line, is very much driven by an experience we all share, namely that we are uh, going through an unusual time, namely a time when new technologies are changing the way we communicate, the way words are exchanged, and that also means how people, what kind of stories get told and how they just get distributed and, and, and read. So I wanted to look at the prehistory of that, to look at earlier moments when new technologies change the way we tell stories. And some of these moments are well known, like the printing press, first developed in, invented in China and then reinvented it by Gutenberg in Northern Europe. But other technologies surprised me I hadn't really thought much about them, and they were at least important as the printing press, and one of them was paper, also invented in China, and then I follow what I call the paper trail from China to the Arabic world, and finally to Europe, uh, uh, where it intersects with uh, the newly developed uh, and reinvented printing press. So different technologies and how they change the way we tell stories, that's, that's one of the through lines. Thank you, Martin. Martin, I'm wondering whether uh, you've talked about different technologies telling stories, but how do the stories change right. with different technologies? Yes. Can yes. we still identify something as a story yes. if the technologies are so diverse? So yeah. it might be worth turning the question right. around and saying, how, have, how has storytelling changed right. in that whole process? And, and that's precisely the, I think, the question to ask. That's the question I ask. How do these new technologies change storytelling itself? Not only how they're distributed, but the stories themselves. And I developed this kind of, these four stages of literature, if you will. The first is the foundational epics that emerge wherever civilizations develop writing. First in Mesopotamia, the Epic of Gilgamesh is the first foundational text I talk about, texts that become reference points for entire cultures. Of course, here in India, there are these amazing foundational texts, a prime example. Um, then I follow an idea that I think is perhaps the most important idea, and that is the moment when some of these stories are declared sacred. Um, story writing was developed for very mundane purposes, namely for accounting purposes. The Mesopotamian scribes that invented writing were really bureaucrats, tax collectors. They took down economic transactions. So writing had a very, has a very mundane, worldly origin. But then at some point, it gets used to write down stories, and that at a later point still, some of these stories are declared sacred. So this technology itself becomes associated with divinity. And I think we have, we've all been living in a world shaped by sacred stories, one way or another. I think today it's almost impossible to imagine a religion without some form of sacred scripture. And that's, it's a very familiar idea, 
but one, once you take this kind of bird's eye view of 4,000 years of literature, you realize it had to be invented at some point, and it had to emerge, and then it, since then it has been holding us in its grip. And it is precisely such a moment when te writing technologies change the way we use stories because they become sacred, and that has really shaped our world, I think, in profound ways. So just to be a little bit mischievous. Please. You say that the link between the, the transformative moment is when the bureaucratic, the banal, as it were, use of uh, writing mm -hmm. turns into the sacred. Is that why money is a god for everybody? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. You know, it, I, when I wrote this book, I didn't think about money at all, but as you say, it turned out to be kind of an important, not through line, but it popped up here and there, in part because when Gutenberg reinvents print, one of the first things he prints is indulgences. Mm. And I would say printing indulgences for the church at the time yeah. is almost like printing yeah. money. You have one page, the, the text in Latin, and then you leave the name of the person who purchases the indulgence free, and the church loved print because suddenly you could print hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of indulgences, and it's almost like printing money. And then, um, and that was the first use of the printing press. Mm. It was only after printing indulgences that uh, Gutenberg printed the Latin Bible, and then later still that Martin Luther translated the Bible into German, and then the, the church lost control of its sacred text. But printing indulgences and later printing paper money is, is, uh, is important. I have a chapter on Benjamin Franklin, mm. whom I describe as a kind of almost modern media entrepreneur who developed a kind of integrated print network from paper mills to print shop. Of course, he was a printer by training to newspapers, broad, broad, broadsides. He even controlled the postal roads on which printed matter was distributed through the 13 North American colonies. And he lobbied very early on to get the monopoly on printing money. And he did. And it's one of the ways in which he uh, established his print empire. So the connection between writing, sacred or profane, and the market yes. of publishing yes. is both an economic argument, but it is also an ethical argument. That's why publishers have very often right. committed themselves to actually freeing language, for, to having literature not open to censorship for various right. kinds. Because, you know, one of the most interesting uh, events I have uh, attended amongst many, many wonderful sessions uh, was the event yesterday on uh, the, Oxford English, uh, the Oxford Dictionary's selection of the Hindi word of the year. Uh -huh. And what really struck me there, and my friend and colleague um, and mentor Ashok Vajpayee is here, is how the language itself, the development of the Hindi language today, goes in two directions. One is in the whole classic direction, keeping the memory of the language alive, and the other, through the press, through media, keeps on tracking the changes. And Ashok read a, a, he spoke a Hindi sentence where most of the words were either came from the Latin, uh, camera, camera, from, from Italian, or they came camisa, camis, uh, television in one sentence. So in a way, storytelling technologies also change through translation, right. through cultural translation. Right. And the question I want to ask to you is this. You focus in the book a lot on foundational texts of a certain cultural moment. Mm -hmm. What about the post-Gutenberg modern temperament of the text being and the story itself internally being a trans, an act, act of cultural and social translation. Yeah. So you begin to see transitions in society, in identities, and right. so on. Yeah, it's a great question. Mm. And so I have a chapter on actually the coinage of the word world literature, which was coined by the 18th, 19th century German writer Goethe in a conversation with his secretary. And for Goethe, there are two things that, are, that, that prompt him 
to coin for the first time the word world literature, which is very important, of course, for, for the book and for all of us. I feel the Jaipur Literary Festival is a place right now where world literature happens. In fact, I should maybe take this occasion to say that I was here four years ago and uh, at the kind invitation of joining you in a panel, Homi, and I loved Jaipur so much that the book now ends here. It ends with the Jaipur Literary Festival as a place where world literature happens. Um, but to, to come back to your, to your question, Homi, so what, what I thought was so interesting about Goethe's coinage of world literature is that he singles out two things. One is the market because he realizes that for the first time he's living in provincial Germany has access to texts not just of Western literature, but of texts from different parts of the world. He reads Chinese novels. These are the first Chinese novels really that are translated into Western languages. He discovers Kalidasa and that influences his own play, uh, Faust. Um, he discovers Persian and Arabic poetry. Um, and so he really realizes that he now has available to him a world market in literature and he urges his contemporaries who tend to be very provincial Europeans to go out of their comfort zone and to read world literature. So that's the market. The other thing is translation because he realizes that the only way in which to conceive of something like world literature is through translation. He describes it almost as the fuel, the fuel of circulation of, of literature. And, and as you know, there are some of our colleagues who are very skeptical of translation, mm -hmm. who insist on reading in the original and so on and so forth. And you know, you and I have spent a lot of time learning different languages, but I in thinking, read, writing this book, I also relied a lot on translation, like Goethe, like everyone who reads world literature. So I have come away from a, with a very different view of translation, namely as that which makes possible the circulation and cultural translation of texts. So Marlon, let me take up a, a couple of questions here. First on Goethe, uh, because when I first wrote about Goethe in the context of post-colonial mm -hmm. translation, a lot of the German scholars beat me on the head and on the behind uh, and told me how I was making a very illegitimate uh, use of Goethe for various reasons. But something else that Goethe said um, impressed me greatly, actually, when I've written about it earlier and also more recently. One, his openness to journalism and to journals. And his, you know, there are the two, the two notes on, on world literature. So that he was also encouraging people to redefine what they understood to be literature in a way that is very relevant to us now. Mm -hmm. The other was something that really struck me as having huge relevance, which is emphasis on war. Saying that, you know, when countries are at war with one another, there is no way that we can maintain a national or territorially bound uh, perspective. We've mm, got mm. to think beyond it. So it's not simply a cosmopolitanism based on peace and consensus. It's also his notion of world literature, as I understand it, is based on conflict and dissent and dissensus. I think that's important. Yeah. But what about the charge that many Persian scholars lay at his door? and many Indic scholars lay at his door, that it's fine for you, Mr. Goethe, to, to read all this stuff and to cite it, but actually your knowledge is rather thin. His you know, should, should we be actually just taking this criticism, or in some way should we be saying, that's the price of the ticket, right. as James Baldwin once yes. put it? Well, I think for Goethe, mm. it is in a way price of his ticket, of the ticket, mm. as he put it, because he lived in provincial Germany, and mm. so he sought out some of the earliest Sanskrit and s s Chinese experts he could find. He really wanted, he understood the importance of cultural knowledge. He, uh, he sought it out, but he had very limited means of doing it. So what I would say is that we should take his desire for cultural context. And he was also a traveler. He traveled to Italy and Sicily. He wanted to travel to Rome. So he understood, I think, the importance of culturally embedded knowledge. Um, we, so we should not take the, his limited 
knowledge as an excuse not to uh, do better, but I would say that he, as a visionary of world literature, very much had that on his mind. Rem re remember again how provincial his context was and how much people around him were making fun of him for reading this, as they felt of it, far-flung literature. And so he, he was really, in a sense, a pioneer, but as many pioneers, there were real limitations to what he <clears throat> knew and what he was able to understand. And so I feel like if we are making it a little bit easier on ourselves to make fun of that, uh, uh, I, I would be more in favor of taking what's inspiring about him and translating it into our own moments. You know, I very much agree with you there. And this raises another question about world literature and also the question of translation. First of all, I want to say, like Goethe, so Kant. When Kant writes the, his work on the cosmopolitical version on perpetual peace, at some level he's also in a borderline, a provincial borderline. You know, the ethic of hospitality to refugees, why does it, which has now become such a major issue, mm -hmm. but provincialism sometimes produces yes. Yes. great cosmopolitan ideas. And right. the snobbery is to think that you have to be living in a great metropolitan center recognized by the rest of the world right. as a global city right. Right. in order to write great right. literature. And I think yeah. that is completely wrong philosophically right. and it's also wrong in literary terms. Right. So what I wanted to ask you about, so what happens to the concept of world literature if the particular product that you're producing, which may be a remarkable work, but it somehow doesn't get translated. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's, we now have an integrated um, market in world literature more than ever, but it's a very uneven one. And, and translation remains such a, such a huge problem. Um, and we in the United States, we who live in an Anglophone world are particularly bad uh, at it uh, in some ways. As, as is well known, only about 2% of two to three percent of books sold in the United States are translated from other languages. And that is, that is a shame. It's, it's, it's a disgrace. Because the market overall is very large, it still means that a fair number of you know, overall texts get translated, but the percentages are, are dismal. So I think there's, to pick up on a point you just made, I think there is um, a kind of provincialism to the, co to, to the cosmopolitan center uh, because you are used to things coming your way. You think you're sort of in the center and there's so much you don't perceive. Um, so I'm very interested in a kind of network of small publishers and journals such as Words Without Borders and others who are trying to fill this niche of translating literature in, into English. And it's also interesting to see in the literary marketplace today, how other languages sometimes play an intermediate uh, 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 role in making authors from minor, from smaller languages, world literature, for example, French. In the case of Eastern Europe, it, German remains to be a language in which some authors are first translated before they are then translated into English. So it's a, it's a complicated, uneven, unfair, world literary marketplace in which the lingua franca, English, is doing a particularly bad job in, um, in recognizing literature written in languages other than English. Martin, translation is the first part of the problem, right? It's only the first part of the problem. The next issue is concerns pedagogy, teaching, courses, syllabus, and curricula. One of, the great, one of the great markers of the Jaipur Literary Festival, and you know, I've realized that every time you get mentioned the Jaipur Literary Festival, you get a clap. <laughs> you don't need to clap, but one of our applause. But one of the great strengths here is, as I said in my keynote talk two mornings ago, that when I'm in Jaipur, I feel that I'm not only a writer or a critic, but I'm a citizen. There's, the crowd here is really representative 
of a wide set of diversities in, the, uh, in, in, in India today and from across the world. The issue is you have the translation. How do you integrate it in a, into a curriculum? What curriculum do you make? Most often, if I might just continue for a second, yeah. people will make either a nation-based curriculum yeah. in an area studies department, and we see the limitations of that, or they will integrate it quite often in a world literature perspective. Right. Let's for the moment look at the world literature perspective. There are times, and please correct me if I'm wrong, and all good systems have their problems, that sometimes the world literature context seems to me to be comparative literature mm. by another name. Mm. And you get a very broad mapping of this particular text here or that text there or that text. You embed each one in its culture. But the connections between the two still remain the model of parallelism and and, and comparison. Yeah. How do we think more about intersection as we've already started talking right. about Goethe or whatever? Right. Yeah. And how do we be develop a curriculum mm -hmm. around it yeah. that allows departments not to say, oh God, you know, if this is happening, then our authority right. is being right. in right. some way compromised. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating challenge and I've mm -hmm. thought a lot about it. The first thing I would say probably that departments, which are often still nationally bound, are probably not the place where this happens uh, in the best way. I think it happens outside departments. The, my book, The Written World, was really in part developed because I was doing a online course, uh, a massive open online course MOOC for Harvard X on world literature. Mm -hmm. And it was really what prompted me to write the book. And the book and the course were developed in, in a kind of parallel way. And I wanted to do it outside national, uh, national literature curriculum, because we also have to think about the curriculum, right? Uh, uh, how to restructure that. Um, so um, I think the through lines that, so we have to get out of, you know, we now compare, you know, English literature to French literature to Nigerian literature, to Japanese literature, we have to get out of that comparative exactly. uh, framework and really think about the longer through lines. And for me, uh, both in the course and, and in the book, one of the through lines was this question of technology and how it changes storytelling. And I felt like it allowed me to connect different types of texts through different technologies in a way that was not comparing one national literature to another national literature. Just to give you one example, I, one of my favorite episodes is uh, about the wonderful Japanese novel, The Tale of Genji, written by Murasaki Shikibu, this lady-in-waiting at the court of Japan uh, uh, over a thousand years ago. There are still a lot of literary histories that say that the novel is a Western uh, a genre, that it started with Don Quixote and so on and so forth. This is all not true. Once you take a world literature perspective, you realize that there are a lot of earlier fantastic important novels, including The Tale of Genji, written hundreds of years before, uh, um, before Don Quixote in a world that was driven by paper. This is the transform one of the transformative effects of paper had on this literary culture in Japan and in resulted in this astonishing text by uh, this lady in waiting at the Japanese court. It's a fascinating story. She had to teach herself literature in secret because women were not allowed to have or not supposed to have access to literary traditions. She spied on her brother being tutored and there, thereby was inducted herself into the literary world and then used her position at court to write, to really conceive of this first unbelievable novel. So as you can tell, I've become quite a proselytizer for some of these texts that are not being taught very much, even in world literature courses. So this was my strategy to get beyond the comparative uh, framework in which I totally agree we are often stuck in in part because of the departments. So go outside the departments, look for the through lines. That's the way forward, I think. You know, you uh, used a word that I've been thinking a lot about, which is the notion of a curriculum. Yeah. I myself am just launching a five or six country notion, uh, 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 research project on 
what would a global, and I have problems with the term, but I'm going to use it for communication, but what would a global humanities curriculum look yes. like? And this is not, sim and this is a, a way to actually activate and give an activist pedagogical, theoretical, as well as implementational idea to the issues that mm -hmm. we've been raising. And so I was thinking, should, I, should we call it a report you know, on the global humanities? I think reports are very passive. They, say they look at from 360 degrees, they plot everything, they make a map, and all the implementational problems are afterwards. Syllabus? No, syllabus is too limited. But I think curriculum is the right word. Because a curriculum, like a curriculum vitae, you know, the story of your intellectual mm, development yes. and your institutional development, a curriculum changes all, changes the rules of the game for other disciplines. So I yes. think if you had a world literature curriculum or yes. a global humanities right. curriculum, that changes the way people work on national literatures. That changes right. the divisions between literature and the social sciences or the human right. sciences. So I think the term curriculum yes. Yes. It really needs to be thought about conceptually and not simply as an institutional right. element or instrument. Yeah. And I think that's a, a, a very important yeah. issue. You know, and that, that really, I, I think, helps me reflect on what I was trying to do in, in, in this book. Because, you know, you, you and I and many others are concerned about the humanities today. And there's a, there was a panel two days ago about higher education and the dominance of STEM, of science and engineering. So developing a humanities curriculum in your sense, I think, is, is crucial. And I think that it stood behind my motivation for the book. I felt that the contribution I wanted to make is not to write a manifesto, although that would be, we need probably such a thing, or a report, but in a way to show world literature in action, to show the real transformative effect literature has had on history and thereby make an argument by demonstrating it, not by preaching it. So, and, and to do that, I realized that uh, a lot of people, when they hear literature, they think of the fiction bookshelf in the bookstore. And how you know, important is that? Well, not very important. But once you expand the notion of literature to written, important written stories, a whole nother set of important texts enters your field of vision, including some of these foundational epics that we talked about earlier, including sacred texts that are written stories, including political texts, which we haven't really talked about, such as the Declaration of Independence, one chapter, or the Communist Manifesto, another. I, I think that the importance of on the influence both the Declaration of Independence and the Communist Manifesto have had in part was because they told new and compelling stories and the author of these texts figured out how to tell a story that really changed people's view of, of the world. So written stories rather than just fiction, I think for me was the way in which to show to people who might be skeptical about the importance of literature or of the humanities, what power written stories can really have once you think about them in this broader sense. So my dear Martin, I want to ask you a question that I pose to myself very often. It's absolutely important to establish new voices, new perspectives, or what you call new foundational texts. But when we do that, are we not creating a new hierarchy? Nothing wrong with it, yeah. but I think the question arises. Aren't we not creating a new hegemony? Yeah. So when I spoke a couple of mornings ago, I, my inspiration was George Orwell. I said the yes. Jaipur Literary Festival should always have a reigning deity. And this time, and it should be a dead reigning deity. Mm. And it should be a provocative one. And one of the things that I talked about in the current context of public discourse here and in the US, etc., from a linguistic point of view, from an ethical point of view, was this notion that you, you Orwell's provocative notion that you can't leave 
politics out mm. of language or literature. Mm. So what would be the politics of world literature? Yeah. Because for us who worked initially in post-colonial literature, we knew in a way what we wanted. Yeah. We wanted to question the primacy of the Enlightenment. We wanted to question, we wanted to question Eurocentricism. Right. So is the, does the politics of world literature have this kind of an interventionist profile other than, other than unseating yes. the national? Right. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. And for me, the politics of world literature is very much a continuation, I think, of post-colonial studies, namely, because the, if you look at most curricula, mm. they are still so European and Western. And I found this very much in my world literature courses. You really have to encourage people to go beyond their reading. In this sense, so many people are not in positions that are so different from Goethe's contemporaries who were skeptical. And so I wanted to make, to have get people a feeling through my book of discovery, of discovering texts that I only came to discover relatively late in life. And, and, and another example is the fantastic West African epic of Sunjata, mm -hmm. which like many uh, foundational epics commemorates the founding of an empire, in this case in the late Middle Ages in what's today Mali, and was transmitted orally for hundreds of years and really only written down in the 20th century, actually in the late 20th century. And, and this is one of the great works of world literature and very few people read it and it's very rarely taught. And so I think this work of adding new voices to the curriculum of uh, displacing a dominance of Western, a kind of unthinking you know, default of Western, continues to be work uh, today. So in that sense, I think world, the politics of world literature, I think, is very much uh, the, similar to the politics of uh, post-colonial studies and that, and that grand project. But to also answer your other question about hierarchies, um, I, of course you have to pick and choose. Uh, there's no uh, doubt about that. And if you choose certain texts, you, you know, leave others out. And that's, that, that is, a, in a sense, I guess you create a, a hierarchy. But I suppose I like to think of it as creating a new story of literature. Mm. I think we need a new story of literature, and this is what I was trying to tell. And yes, there are certain preferences and choices I had to make, but that, uh, that I think was the ambition. So my emphasis on the concept of curriculum, mm -hmm. rather than canon or rather than uh, or syllabus, is because even if you're selective in creating any specific right. uh, curriculum, a really strong curriculum opens up the possibilities of those texts that are not looked at to be looked at right. again. Right. That's the important thing, I think, about a curriculum. That's why it impacts on so many other disciplinary right. bodies of knowledge. You don't have to say everything, right. but you have to say enough to provoke another person to say something about something else. It's like a billiard game, you know? It's like a game of billiards, where you have a cannon, as they say, I believe, I don't play billiards, but you have a cannon, then you have a, 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 a counter cannon. You know, you shoot the, the pole and something else hits something else and then you, yeah. get, you get a game. So in that context, I wonder, picking up on a word you've just used, whether with the new technologies, with blogs, with Twitter, with continual Facebook um, um, a presentation, uh, instantaneous, changing all the time. Are we returning to an oral mode of communication mm. through writing? Yeah. Is there a new orality that is entering our discourse after years post Gutenberg of the printed right. word and the right. authority of the printed word? Right. Yeah. No. It's it's a it's a fascinating topic. I think, you know, having looked at these earlier moments of new technologies, print, but also paper and, and, and other technologies, at each of these inflection points, I would say the relationship between the written word and the spoken word gets reconfigured. The one never replaces the other because story, oral storytelling continues to drive the literary world in profound ways up to the present, including the 
example of the epic of Sunjata I just mentioned that you know, it's, it's based on a continuing uh, oral storytelling uh, tradition. And that epic, by the way, was written down because it was first recorded by tape recorder. So that, for me, is another interesting technology from the 70s, was recorded in the 70s, and then transcribed. So um, I think you're right. Our current technologies, new technologies, which are just emerging, and there are so many forms that, that, that it will take, is going to reconfigure yet again the relationship between oral orality and writing. But I would say that it's not gonna, again, neither is writing displacing orality nor the other way around, because what strikes me is that today, in fact, thanks to these technologies, more is being written by more people than ever before. If I look at the grand history of the written word 4,000 years ago, we are living through an incredible explosion. Because so part of the story I'm telling is really a story of democratization. And I think that is very much uh, the case today, that just more people have access to not just reading and writing and rising literary, literacy rates, but to writing and publishing. Now, of course, that creates an incredibly overwhelming situation where we need filters and we have to think about how to deal with this overwhelming number of stories and voices that are entering for the first time the written world. But I think it is overall an, an incredible moment for, for literature in that broad sense because of that. So I think more is being written and read and published uh, and tweeted and blogged uh, uh, and Instagrammed than ever before. So it is, we're living through an explosion of, of literature and it will reconfigure yet again uh, uh, the relation to orality. Um, Martin, you're, let me not dampen your enthusiasm. <laughs> um, and I, because I very much see what you are saying and I think that there is no point being a Luddite and you know, standing away, right. and I don't want to stand away, I want to jump right in. So let me just say a couple of things. One, democratization, in my view, and correct me if I'm wrong, is not about more. More people, more writing, more voices. Democratization is about distribution mm -hmm. and redistribution. And it seems to me, from that point of view, that very often the claims that anyone can go on Twitter is not, is not necessarily, it may be a good thing, it may be a bad thing, but it is not necessarily democratizing. It, because democracy, as we know, for to be useful, needs to be mediated through institutions. That's true. It needs to have, make a distinction between information and knowledge. Right. And the, the thing that actually makes information into knowledge is interpretation. Yes. That's what allows you to, right. to clear it up and yeah. say this is chaff and not interpretation in a draconian sense yes. that you stop any or you censorship, right. but the educational aspect. Right. And that's what right. I think we haven't, we, with the decline of the humanities, right. what we don't have is that democratic responsibility yes. to the ethics of interpretation. Mm -hmm. Interpretation mm -hmm. is an ethical movement, not simply as a way of learning more meanings or creating more. That's one yeah. concern I have. The other concern I have, to go back to the question of democracy, but also to go back to the question of plurality that you are rightly celebrating, is, you know, for there to be a good democratic system, one doesn't only have to express oneself or write, there has to be a respect given to listening. It's true. And it seems to me that there is a cacophony. You hear a babel of voices. But the, 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 the no moment of reflection, you need to listen before responding, is problematic. And this is why I think in many countries of the world, we have what I call a tit-for-tat democracy. Everybody wants to get in on the act of expressing, but what the larger rules of the game are not being, mm. uh, are not being confronted. In India, you turn on, and I spend a lot of time here, you turn on a serious political, what seems to be like a serious political uh, program, and all you get is, 
Why do you say that I'm obstructing the parliament? What did you do in, in 1992? Did you not? So there's a continual back and forth. And for the public, for the citizen, and Jaipur is a literature festival right. for the citizens, right. you don't get what the rules of the game are. Irrespective of your political vision, where should we be going yeah. together? Yeah, yeah. So listening, I think, is mm. very important. Would you agree with I, that? I totally, that's very beautifully said, and I totally, totally agree. And I think what, what that makes me think is that the, how profoundly changes in technology, again, changes what the public is, the notion yes. of the, you know, our sense of the public sphere is very much a product of the printing press. There was a new type of public that was brought in by the invention of paper. There's a new kind of public that was created in Greece because of the introduction of the alphabet. So again, each of these inflection points doesn't just change literature in this narrow sense. It really ch changes something very profound, maybe how we, co how we communicate in private and in public, and it changes our notion of the public. And I think some of what you are describing uh, is, is a change in, in the public and uh, how these technologies, you, you just realize yet again how, what a profound change it is when you change reading and writing technologies because it changes everything about our public. You know, uh, Martin, when you talk about the formation of new publics through technologies, I think at the moment of the Me Too movement mm -hmm. against the assault and exploitation of women, both in the pub private sphere but also in the public sphere, I think we are beginning to see a new public being formed mm -hmm. out of the uses of right. the new technology, right. which starts with that but then gives women the confidence to create a public sphere right. where they can come out and say, me too. Right. And I think this is extraordinarily important. I do see the Me Too movement as being, in a way, the late construction of the women's revolution. Yeah. There is something about this that I find really very compelling. Yeah. And I think this is also a good example of how new technologies that allow new voices to enter now is, are transforming institutions, right? Because this is what the Me, Me Too Me movement has managed to do from an ability to gather new voices to now filter up or transform institutions from you know, literary journals, from the way Hollywood studios do work from newspapers. So you, we have really that, that connection, right? It doesn't ha it, it's not enough to just tweet and then we, we are happy, but I think it shows that Twitter and you know, this Google Docs document that was uh, Shitty Man in Media, these two technologies triggered something that now the Me Too movement has been very successful in transforming into a transformation of some of the most important institutions. And this is, I think, when you can start to appreciate the power of, of this. Yes, and I would just say very quickly, technology in this sense is becoming an ethical yes. issue. It's, it's the transformation yes. of technology and science in a way into the realm of ethics and equality. Yeah. And I think that's very important. I think we now have, what, 10 minutes to go? Is that right? I think we have still 18 minutes, right? According well, to I this. I can't time. tell from here. I'm very bad at numbers. I'm very bad at letters. Yeah. What is it? We have more than 15 minutes. One, more than 15 minutes. So one final question, and okay. then we'll open up. Why? does literature very often make people go ballistic? <laughs> you know, this is, I mean, I think it's quite a good thing, personally, just as I was saying a moment ago, the new technology turning to the Me Too movement is a right. good thing. But we say truth is stranger than fiction, mm -hmm. and literally that is often true. People are threatened to be killed for writing a phantasmatic story, right. something that in the 18th century would never have occurred because people, I mean, I'm sure that they were, but people would have seen the notion of fantasy. I'm not saying that the, this would have happened within mm -hmm. church or theocratic society, but people, literature drives people crazy, even when they know that it's a fantasy, even when they know that it's an it's a invented character. We have to confront this wonderful 
provocative power. Right. No, and I think this is, this is a wonderful way of formulating it, and I think that spe it, it speaks to the power of storytelling, and as long as we think of literature as just something that sits on the fiction bookshelf, we don't appreciate it. When we recognize it as a very profound technique of storytelling, we realize that people have been killing each other and, you know, being driven, driven crazy by it f for, forever. You know, I tell the story of how Alexander the Great thought mm. of his conquest of parts of Asia, Asia as a reenactment of the Iliad. He slept on his copy of the Iliad every night during his conquests. He, the first place he went to in Asia Minor was Troy, even though it has had no strategic importance, and he he thought of himself as a new Achilles. And so that's just one of the many uh, uh, versions, uh, stories I tell in the book of the, the shaping power of literature. Doesn't mean it's always for the better. I mean, that's, that's the thing about a powerful tool, and I'm really, uh, I started to think of storytelling as a tool the, on the cover of my book as a hammer. And I think that uh, was a very clever way of designing it. And of course, you can, the question is how you use a hammer. Uh, or, a, or a sickle. Or a sickle, <laughs> exactly. But so I think that, the, I, I, in a sense, looking at this 4,000 year uh, history of, of literature, I'm, I'm not surprised that people uh, are doing crazy by literature today because they always have, because the kinds of stories we tell, the kinds of stories we live by is, is one of the most profound things. And when you talk about Alexander, with his copy of the Iliad, um, and wanting to re, you know, to re, to to to, uh, to to redo, to restructure the whole fate of that uh, moment, I think actually of the stories told about George W. Bush, W. Yeah. wanting to go into Iraq, right. very much because of the you know his father's right. uh, his, his problems right. before, right. and wanting to somehow set the uh, set the stage right again. Right. Let's now open up for questions. Uh, lots of good questions. So we'll, um, yes, the lady in the blue jacket, and then the lady in the orange jacket, and then the gentleman in the red. And I'm going to wait until we get that done. I have two short questions for Mr. Martin. The first one is, I would like to know which is the rarest book the rarest book in the world as of now, and what is the monetary value? So which book? Mm, the rarest, rarest of book, all. and how much oh, does it cost? First edition, oh, yes. the first published book, and what is its monetary value yeah. as of now? Can I ask you, for the moment, can we do one question per person, please? One question, and then we can come back to two yeah. questions. Yeah. yeah. It's just yeah. yeah. One question in two parts. Okay. It's, yes. It's yes. Oh. Okay. And and also of the hold it close to your mouth. The evolution of language along with civilization, because I've heard Armenian is supposed to be one of the first languages that led to the evolution of English. Yes. May I persuade the next questioner not to have a three-part question, which is actually a one question. <laughs> Right. So the, the rarest book, there, you know, you only know the monetary value of something if it comes on the market. Mm. And I think some of the rarest books are not are exactly. held by museums. One text that I talk about is the first printed text in the world, which is the Diamond Sutra, uh, you know, printed in 868 in China on paper with woodcut prints. It's held in the in the British Museum, British Library, and um, it's but it's you know. Thankfully, it's not for sale. Thank you. Next question. Uh, hello, no, no, sir. the lady in the orange. Thank you for a wonderfully erudite discussion. And of course, I have so many questions, but what, just one. The measurement of, um, through global indices, are a way of changing behaviors. And you talked about translation, you talked about inclusiveness, and the curriculum for the world literature. Now, have you um, discovered through your technology, the whole study of technology and its impact on language, on the global indices and how that might change, whether it's uh, doing business or those types of indices or the uh, price of a Big Mac being 
put in as an in, um, part of an index. Do you have something on that? I Sorry, we just need to clarify this question. What is an, in what and is what an is index? Is it the global happiness index or the global hamburger index? This is a problem. So, yes, cost of living index, or it's oh. the and doing business index. And or your it's question any kind is what? That has the teaching of world literature registered on these global indexes to see how it has influenced these modes of living or the good life or whatever? Well, the, not, not to my knowledge, but mm. maybe it would be a good idea to do it. Because you see, so can I just say, there's it just it strikes me that the question of a global index doesn't often take into uh, t take cognizance of the notion of narrative. What we've been talking about is narrativity. How mm. would you index right. the measure of a narrative as actually reducing the price of a hamburger? Right. The jump is huge. Yes, no, this gentleman here in red. Uh. You've got to police this. Think carefully. You're, you're a great policeman, homie. Uh, hello, sirs. Uh, uh, my question is to you both because uh, you quoted James Baldwin's uh, idea of literature through circulation, which is the fuel of uh, fuel of uh, reading world literature. So that is how we gain knowledge of the world literature. So I'm glad of the fact that we got to know about favelas in Brazil. Uh, the slums in Rio de Janeiro are known as favela or that the uh, village administration system in Russia is known as Zemstvo because of Tolstoy. But how do you, what is your take on the fact that a uh, logist as prestigious as, like as uh, remarkable as J.A.B. Van Butenen calls Singhasan as the lit uh, in its literal translation as the lion's throne? So how do you take that here. in translation? Like, since we uh, perceive world literature mostly through translation, how do you perceive this erroneous translation? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, part of the power of stories and literature that you mentioned, Homi, and that I write about is that it is a very contested issue. And I, I talk about, uh, as a rise parallel to the invention of sacred scripture, uh, something called textual fundamentalism, right? That we become very insistent on certain interpretations and their communities of interpretation that, that use the technology of writing in a way to create texts that really hold us in our grip. And so I, it, not knowing very much about the particular context you're talking about, I would say it's probably part of that because literature and the stories we live by are not benign. Uh, they're there are huge struggles over, over how to interpret them um, and how to translate them and whether to translate them and who is allowed to translate them and so on and so forth. So it seems to me part of that phenomenon. Homi, do you have... Uh, yes. Yeah. So this goes back to what I was saying about the ethics of translation and the importance of education in this whole process. If you don't have the right educational apparatus, you can keep on translating or mistranslating. But the important thing is, if you take a translational view on how epics get transmitted or how classics get turned into classics, if you take a translational view, you open up the question of interpretation. There will be mistranslations, and you understand why those. Is this a mistranslation because the person doesn't know the language? Is it a mistranslation because this person is very Eurocentric or very blind to other cultures? That's the important thing. A translational approach to literature keeps open the democratic dialogue. It doesn't shut it down. And I think that, I would say, is the most important issue. Now, I'm going to take this lady with the orange dupatta, and then I'm going to move from the right wing to the left wing. Yeah. I am so sorry for being right wing right now. Um, I have... From what I understand... Hold your microphone very close your to your mouth. and ask one question, dear friend. Yeah, sure. Um, curricula, literature, historicity of texts in conversation with their context need to provide a deliberation and a temporality that is very different from the kinds of stories one believes. 
one wishes that every Trump supporter would stop believing every story and read a book. One wishes every Modi supporter would stop believing every story and read a book. This sort of uneven temporality between what we want the written literature to do versus the stories that we believe, the stories that citizenships seem to be based on versus the kind of liberation that literature and the citizenship that that would you know, espouse. That unevenness of temporality, could, could you talk a little more about okay. that? Okay, okay. Well, I, you know, the, you're making a distinction between literature and stories, and my sense is that you value literature. Literature is reading, it's maybe reflective, maybe it's secular, and stories are the stories in our heads that we believe, I mean, not sure, you're shaking your head, so I'm, I'm misunderstanding you. Do you want to clarify? No, no, doesn't matter. Okay. Go ahead with the <laughs> misunderstood point. In, in, uh, well, I, in, in that case, I'm not sure there's much point yeah. in that. But so, so I, I would say that, you know, the question is where do the stories that, that, that are in our heads, where do they come from? Um, I think it's, my view of literature is a much more expansive one. And so I, would, I, w I guess I would ask you that, where do these stories come from? I don't fully understand the distinction between stories yeah. and literature that you're making. So I think my ability to answer is hampered, I suppose. So the question, he says, I would ask you, that's only a rhetorical question. He doesn't want you to answer at this point, but since you pose the question Later. to me too, let me just tell you, the crux of the question is temporality, different forms of time and the way in which meaning circulate. But by saying that books allow you to deliberate and public discourse can produce rumor or myth or fiction, if I get you right, is, I think, the problem. Public discourse should be as responsible, and it, but it needs a different kind of deliberation. It takes up a different sort of narrative or time as reading. So I think we've got to work for both. Sorry, sorry, dear. I think we've got to work in both directions at the same time to make public discourse a deliberative, dialogical, democratic language. And we have one, I think, one here, and then one with the lady with the ash blonde hair, right? So let's have the, the, the red scarf and the ash blonde Thank hair. you, sir. Um, it's a straightforward I'm not stereotyping you. Yeah. It's a straightforward question that I wanted to ask based upon the discussion we've had on the world literature curriculum um, right here. The question is that if we were to form a framework or discuss the idea of world literature as curriculum, then, then we'll need to refigure what we, what we think about humanities per se. And interpretations are subjective. So in, in the work that you have here, there is a kind of a defense of the humanities that's coming out. Uh, and it's very useful for all of us as well. Yes. So I want to just sort of get your vision of this kind of a curriculum that you have with respect to these concerns. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, as I said before, I yes, it, I do think of my book as a defense of the humanities, but not as a defense of, you know, writing another Jeremiah mm. or manifesto, why, mm. not, why does no one care about us in the humanities, but really to show it in action. And so that would be my, I think that is my, approach to teaching as well. And since I teach a lot of general education courses and through online, really people from all over the world, um, mo many of the people who interact, who I interact with in the, in the context of these courses are not literature majors, right? So they are, you know, from all walks of life. Many are, you know, the, the ages of the online student population goes from 15 to 85. So, um, and I feel like they respond to that because the, the problem with saying why, why, do, why no one cares about us in the humanities anymore, that it always sounds like special pleading, right? We are preaching to the choir, we in the humanities get together and, and wring our hands about why we are being sort of pushed aside by STEM uh, research and all of that. And so I, I felt that there was increasingly limited was not effective to just wring my hands about it. So I thought that you know, showing, showing it in action, um, writing about literature that makes people curious, uh, gives them a sense of discovery, and connects literature to, 
to history writ large, gives them access to understanding uh, about the world. That, that's the path I'm experimenting with. Uh, and I think that uh, that's maybe, so that would be my answer. Yeah. Let's, uh, I just want to pick up on two things you've just said. If you think about the discussion we have at the Jaipur Literary Festival in session after session, whether it's to do with the politics of institutions, whether it is to do with the, the Hindi, uh, the, 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 the OED's notion of uh, the, you know, the best, the most, most common Hindi word, with whatever this discussion here, you realize that the humanities do not need a defense. They need advocates because we have raised in this very hall today issues to do with politics, public discourse, citizenship, civil society, writing, technology, material notions of paper, art. We have found a way of dealing with all these issues. So I really don't think that the humanities need they need activists, they right. need advocates. Right. We don't need to defend ourselves against anything. I've never once convened a panel called the crisis of the humanities. I think the crisis is in disciplines which don't listen, and we talked about the ethics of listening earlier on. Secondly, not all interpretations are subjective. Value is a relational issue. It's not a subjective issue. That's what our education has to teach. That doesn't mean values are cast in stone, but it is a communally negotiated notion. Interpretation is a communally negotiated notion. That is where poetics and pedagogy and ethics come together. So I would just say, let's not say, as scientists often say, oh, you literary people, you historians, all this is subjective. It's not subjective. It has a resonance of truth and reality and action as much as any issue in STEM only the provable, how you actually prove it, is different from an experimental uh, scientific approach. Final question, the lady. Thank you for your description of my hair first. Uh, <laughs> say my well, I'm sorry, this is only because I needed an index. No, that's fine. I'm fine with that. Uh, my question, Dr. Puckner, I'm going to take you to the last chapter, the, to the, towards the end of your book, where you talk about J.K. Rowling. Uh, we say that uh, the reading habit begins very young. Uh, could you talk to us a little more about the translation and the power of young adult literature yes. as yes. you see it now? Yeah. Thank you. And, and I think this is one of the other reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an optimist about literature and writing today because of the explosion of young adult fiction and the fact that, you know, there are, there are lots of things to be said about Harry Potter. Um, but the fact that so now two generations of, uh, of children have grown up with the books, really, um, and, and more generally the explosion of young adult uh, 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 literature, I think makes me just hopeful as, as, as a phenomenon uh, that uh, this technology generation that, that we are raising is not going to turn away from literature. I think it's going to change what, what, what they read and how they read, but I think there's no doubt in my mind that they will continue to read, and, they are, they, and, and they are. So, um, and since you mentioned this as part of my last chapter, as Homi mentioned earlier, my last chapter really ends the story of 4,000 years of literature, ends not with Harry Potter, but it ends with the Jaipur mm -hmm. Literary Festival, and maybe that's just another way of celebrating what's happening here. I think this is a wonderful place to end, because we have tried to increase the scale and scope of what we understand as literature into an imaginative but also interventionist, socially responsible, aesthetically adventurous, provocative way of talking about so many issues that are we raised today politically, institutionally, emotionally, aesthetically, ethically. And I thank you, Martin, for making this possible. And I thank you all for being here in the Jaipur literary tradition of being a citizen reader.